Okay, here we go. This is uh, uh, Grace in the uh, Book of Romans, lesson number 11. Uh, the uh, title of this particular lesson, The Request of Grace. And we'll be covering Romans chapter eight, beginning in verse one. So in our last lesson, we looked at the, uh, the final chapter that dealt with God's response of grace to man's sins. We had quite a few lessons on that particular topic. In chapter seven, Paul explains that even though grace saves us through faith, there is a constant struggle in our lives because the new regenerated man must dwell within the confines of sinful flesh. And so he talks about that personal experience, what it's like being you know, saved, being regenerated, having the spirit, but at the same time struggling with sinful flesh. Um, uh, basically, he teaches that grace saves the soul, but it doesn't eliminate the suffering and the struggle caused by sin and experienced by every single Christian. I really appreciate the fact uh, that this uh, section is included by God, by the Spirit, uh, an apostle of God, an apostle of the gospel, actually talking about his own personal struggle uh, with sin, uh, something that we can all relate to. So in chapter eight, the apostle explains what this grace demands of us and how God provides for us in enabling us to meet these demands. So that's why the lesson is called the request of grace. So the idea is that grace demands, but grace also empowers at the same time. So it demands that we live spiritual lives, no longer slaves of sin, and it also provides two things that enable us to do that. Number one, it provides justification. In Romans chapter eight, verse one, Paul writes, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This verse is the high point of the section we have just finished. It's the summary statement for all that has been said so far. Um, that we are not condemned by God for what we are guilty of doing, that's called being justified. Now in today's language, sometimes there's a little confusion there. In today's language, justified means we have good cause, or we have good reason to do something, or we have a good excuse for what we have done. You know, he was justified. She was justified in saying that because this happened and so, you know. But in biblical language, it means something different. In biblical language, it means we have been found innocent. We are counted not guilty. Even if we've committed the crime, we are pronounced not guilty. Now the first seven chapters of the book of Romans explains how God accomplished this justification on our behalf through Jesus Christ and why, why He did it. Uh, we were guilty of sin. We were to be condemned to hell because of it. Uh, nothing we could say or do could change the judgment upon us. That, that was our condition. And then God sent Jesus to suffer the punishment of death for us. And because of His sacrifice, our sins are now paid for. And then God offers this innocence, this justification to those who believe and obey the gospel. And this is how grace provides justification for sinners. This is why there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Well, because those who are in Christ, that means those who are associated with or linked to or within Jesus, you can use any of those prepositions there, these people have been justified. In other words, they are considered innocent. They are considered not guilty. So there's no condemnation if you are justified. Now, grace demands, you know, this grace that gives you this justification, this same grace demands that you live a spiritual life. And now that you are justified, you can do so. And here's why. First of all, there are no sins that separate you from God. Again, it's not that we uh, don't sin, not that we fail and like, you know, that we're perfect. It's just that the sins are not counted against us. 
Why? Because of grace. Why? Because Jesus has paid for them. Okay. God now looks favorably upon us. So that means our prayers, our actions, our efforts to please Him are acceptable because we are acceptable. Another reason uh, that, um, or another thing that justification does, we know what spiritual living is. Christ who justifies you also reveals in His word what spiritual living is all about. And it's very different than the old life. Before I knew Christ, before I knew the word, I, I you know, had some idea, yeah, God's up there somewhere. Yeah, the big man in the sky. You know, yeah, the big man in the sky, the big daddy up there. You know, that was my notion of God. But once you start reading the scriptures, you find out, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> God is holy, God is righteous, God has demands, God has grace, you know, and you, you, you understand more his, his character and what He is asking of you. He reveals to you the life He wants you to live. And then um, you, know, um, you have hope, third thing, you have hope. There's no motivation to live spiritually if there's no hope of heaven. I mean, why try if there's no hope of heaven? Jesus guarantees our acceptability through His death on our behalf and through His resurrection, He guarantees our accessibility to heaven. I mean, why would I try to live the spiritual life if there's no heaven at the end of it? And why am I motivated for heaven? Well, I've seen that it's possible. Historically, Jesus comes to earth and does something historically that I can relate to, that I can see through the writings of the apostles. The idea is if that happened to him, that could happen to me too. That's the promise. So the first way that grace provides for the spiritual lifestyle that it demands is by assuring us that we are innocent before God and we can look forward to being with Him one day, despite the struggle with sin that we continue to experience. That's the idea. Every day I struggle with sin and it would be awfully discouraging if I didn't have that promise in front of me. If I didn't have that assurance that I'm okay. These sins are just part of the natural struggle because we say to ourselves, you know what, if I'm saved, if I'm a Christian, if I'm, you know, I've got the spirit, why do I have these terrible thoughts? Why, do I, why am I sometimes tempted to do things that are awful? Thankfully you have Romans 7. Because the regenerated man is alive and hopeful for heaven, but that regenerated person lives inside this sinful flesh and that, you know, that seesaw is, is, is always going on. Grace provides justification. Secondly, grace provides sanctification. We should actually say grace provides for sanctification. And in chapter 8, verses 2 to 39, Paul explains this process. Now we need to understand that justification, that is a one-time event. You are never any more innocent or acceptable or justified as the day that you come out of the waters of baptism. You can't get any more innocent. You can't get any more sin-free. You cannot become more acceptable, more righteous in the eyes of God than the day that you are justified by the blood of Christ as you confess His name in the waters of baptism. I'll give you an example. A newborn baby right, is alive, comes out of its mother. That baby is alive. But that baby is as alive as a 50-year-old man or woman. That baby cannot get any more alive than on the day it's born. Well, in the same way, the day that you're justified is the day that you are born, or born again, if you wish, and it is the day that you become alive in Christ. And nothing that you can do can make you more alive or more saved than on that day. Now, that baby that we're talking about, that baby can develop and mature and grow in its skills and appreciation of life, so on and so forth. Well, in the same way, Christians can and must develop, mature, 
and grow in skill to appreciate and function in the spiritual world. You know, if the baby does not grow, it'll remain helpless and die. In the same way, if the Christian does not grow, he will also die spiritually. It's the same law that affects both. Now this process of growth spiritually, this process of growth is called sanctification. Justification is a one-time event that makes us alive, born again. Sanctification is a lifetime process of growth and development that ends when the physical body is shed in death and the fully formed spiritual body emerges. This is the most misunderstood principle in Christianity. The difference between justification and sanctification. So grace provides for this sanctification process, how? By giving us the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter two, verse 38, Peter explains how one obtains justification. What does he say? Repent and be baptized, right? In the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. But then he mentions that there, those who are justified in this way, they receive something. And what is it that they receive? And he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts chapter two, he doesn't mention why we receive the gift or what the Holy Spirit is going to do within us. I mean, that's just basic Bible. You know, the, the apostles, when they spoke or wrote or preached or whatever, they didn't say everything about a particular topic every time they mentioned that topic. So Peter mentions, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't give all the details about the Spirit. He just says one thing, you'll receive it at baptism, period. It is left to Paul in Romans chapter eight to explain that the Holy Spirit is given to dwell within each Christian, what for? in order to complete the process of sanctification. Jesus accomplishes the justification. He dies, pays for the sins. The Holy Spirit accomplishes the sanctification, the process, the maturing process. So in verses two to 39 in chapter eight, Paul is going to explain how the Holy Spirit works to accomplish this sanctification within us. So the first thing the Spirit does is He leads us. Verses two to 10, let's read together. It says, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So Paul says the Holy Spirit provides the word of God. He provides gifts to serve. We read about that in Romans chapter 12, verse one. The gifts, we read about that in 2 Peter chapter one. He provides encouragement to do what is right. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. I don't have all the time to read all those passages, but you have those references in your notes. In all of these ways, the, the Spirit directs us in the way a spiritual person should go. Living according to the Holy Spirit's direction contributes to our spiritual maturity. And that's what he's saying here. You're no longer walking according to the flesh. You're no longer you know, living your old life since you've been justified. 
Now that you have the Spirit living within you and now the Spirit is guiding you, how? Well, He's providing you the Word. He's providing you the church. He's providing you teachers. He's providing you all this example to help you walk in a correct way. He leads you now. Now you have guidance for your life. Whereas before, you just lived any old way that you wanted to live. So how does the Spirit provide sanctification? Well, He provides us with the things that we need to live and walk a spiritual life. Secondly, the Spirit resurrects us. The final step, oh, verse 11, he says, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So the final step in this process here will occur after death. And it is the Holy Spirit that will resurrect the believer from the grave. Why is it important to have the Holy Spirit? Well, because it's through the power of that Spirit that I will resurrect from the dead. Peter doesn't mention this in Acts chapter two. He just says you're going to have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Imagine, he didn't, you know, he didn't mention one of the more important things about that. That's why we have the New Testament. That's why we have all of this information. So sanctification, that process is there only to give us a taste, a glimpse of what is to come. And the Holy Spirit guarantees that we will resurrect, how? Well, by resurrecting Christ, by giving us an example of His power. Thirdly, how does the Holy Spirit work to accomplish sanctification? The Spirit empowers us to overcome sin. So it says, he says, so then brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. So sin is what causes separation from God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to gain the upper hand over sin in our lives. Paul has already said in Romans 7, not the complete domination, there's always, you know, the flesh is always fighting us to the bitter end. But he says in chapter eight, we can gain the upper hand. Who's in charge here? Who's directing? Which way, what, what is our goal? You know, I, may not, I may not always hit the target, but now I know what the target is. <laughs> and now I use the things that God gives me to, to work my way towards that target. Well, this, is, this is important because we want to keep a close relationship with God and we want to enjoy the fellowship that we have with Him and that fellowship produces peace and joy and assurance. And so the more we overcome sin, the closer God draws near to us. You know, there's that passage that said, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. How do you draw near to God? Oh, by dealing with sin. It's sin that separates us from God. It's sin that clouds our vision, that makes us unable to see Him and appreciate Him clearly. And so every time we make an attempt to overcome sin or to deal with sin in our lives, every time we cry out to Him in prayer and ask Him, please help me with this thing, whatever it is, you know, we, that, is a, that is a step in drawing closer to God. And drawing closer to God has great benefits, immediate benefits. It's not just like, oh, one day in heaven. No, 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 no. Drawing closer to God has immediate benefits now. As I said, peace of mind and joy and strength All right, another one. How does the Holy Spirit accomplish sanctification? The Spirit comforts us. Verses 15 to 25, he says, For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Really long passage here. You know, Paul, among other things, is saying we have been justified we have been promised heaven. We have been told that God loves us. But as we look around, what do we see? We see weakness. We see sinfulness. As we look around the world, what do we see? Everything around us, including ourselves, is dying. There's injustice. There's violence in the world. You, know, you could you open the paper and you say, that's not fair. Or, this is unjust. And that person lied. And how could this person have done this? And you know, an explosion here and a flood that takes people away there and an earthquake. <laughs> you know, and you see children being carried out of you know, buildings. Their poor little bodies crushed. They didn't do anything. They're sleeping in their cribs and the house just falls on. You, know, you look around, there's just nothing but death. So what does Paul say here? What's the Holy Spirit doing in all of this? Is the Holy Spirit fixing this broken world? No. Is the Holy Spirit you know, saving the earth? No. Is the Holy Spirit preventing you know, innocence from dying and injustice from happening in the world? No. So what's he doing? The Holy Spirit is sustaining our hope in salvation despite the evidence to the contrary. Everything around us tells us that what we believe is not so and will not happen. The Holy Spirit helps our hearts to believe and to continue hoping in the promises of Christ despite the things that happen around us not just around us, but in our own lives. Why did my mother get cancer? Why did my brother die in a car accident? You know, I mean, these are all things that take place in the world. What he talks about, the groaning and the suffering, he's talking about you know, the, the terrible, the lost condition of the world. And so the Spirit of God in us keeps the hope alive. Otherwise, we just drown in sorrow. What else does the Spirit do? How does the Holy Spirit work to accomplish sanctification? He prays for us, verse 26 and seven. In the same way, he says, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit is God and as God He knows our hearts and He knows the mind of God as well. And so He guarantees that our prayers come before God in an acceptable way, always wrapped in faith in Christ. You know, we're physical, we're sinful, we're limited by the material world. The Holy Spirit makes our communication with a spiritual being possible and profitable for us. Imagine how different God is than we are. I mean, listen, we, have, we, you know, we spend you know, months training a dog, you know, communicating with a dog to let the dog know, you know your food's over here, come here, sit, go forward, you know, don't pee on the floor. You know, we spend months trying to communicate with a dog and yet a dog in us you know, physically they breathe, we breathe, they have a heart, we have a heart, you know what I'm saying? Can you imagine the difference between us and God? Not even the same nature. You know, it's because we think, you know, we see God as you know, granddad or a nice old man up there. You know, and 
God is so different. We can't even get our mind around who God is. And so the Spirit helps us relate to a being that we just cannot even imagine what that being is like. He makes sure that our groanings, because it's interesting, our most articulate prayers you know, that we explain in a lot of detail to God, you know, Paul refers to these things as uh, you know, he says that's pretty much what it is in spiritual language. Groanings. So we have the assurance that our groanings you know, will come before God in the, in, the proper, in the proper manner. Another way that the Holy Spirit works to accomplish our sanctification, He protects us, verse 28 to 39, He says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So once we are justified, the Holy Spirit's work is to make sure that the evil one does not destroy our souls. You know, Paul says that he works all things for the good of our salvation. You know, sometimes we, uh, we go, we're looking for a, a car or something, you know, and we find a, a good deal on a car and, and someone will say, oh, it's wonderful, you know, God works all things for good. Because I got this great deal on a car. Yeah, no. <laughs> And maybe you were blessed already, but please don't use that scripture because you found a bargain. The scripture that the spirit you know, works all things for good, all things for the good of your soul, all things for your salvation. Everything is working together to save you and to keep you saved. That's how all things work together. That's what the spirit is, is, is doing. Okay? Now we can deny the spirit, we can quench the spirit, we can willingly permit Satan to come into our lives so we can worship him and as a result destroy our souls. However, without that invitation, without our willing cooperation to abandon Christ and follow the devil in his world, Satan can no longer capture or destroy our souls. That's the answer, by the way, this is the passage that you read to someone who says, can we still be possessed by a devil today? You know, there's always that question. The answer is no, why? Romans right here. Why? Because the spirit in us is protecting us against that. And John says that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. The spirit in us is stronger than the evil that is in the world. And so the Holy Spirit works all things to guarantee our growth and development in Christ and our safety from Satan. That's how he works all things. Listen, God sends his own son to die on the cross. And the purpose of that? Well, to purchase our souls. Don't you think 
that he would do everything possible to protect that investment, if you wish, put it in a financial terms. He's invested the most precious thing. Don't you think he sends the Holy Spirit to protect the most precious thing that we have? This is why it's so foolish when people take chances with their soul, with their salvation. It was purchased at such a great cost. And God has invested so much of Himself into keeping us safe. It's such a shame when we throw all this away or usually don't consciously throw it away. We're just careless, we're sloppy with it. Terrible. So in these verses, Paul describes the various ways that the Holy Spirit accomplishes our growth and development in Christ. And this growth and development in Christ, we refer to as sanctification. He directs us in how we should live. He empowers us to overcome sin. He comforts our fears and doubts and pain. He helps our prayer life. He protects us from the evil one. And then of course, He is the power that resurrects us from the dead. So grace requires that we live spiritual lives. And we want to do this. You know, we want to do this because grace ignites that desire within us. But living spiritual lives requires two things and grace provides these two things. First, justification through Christ and secondly, complete sanctification through the Holy Spirit. And so in the following chapters that we're going to, uh, to study in chapters nine to 11, uh, Paul is going to talk about the ones who refused the grace. Here he's talking about all the ones that received the grace. You know, chapters one all the way to eight and what grace does and what grace demands. Chapters nine, 10, 11, he's going to talk about the ones who rejected the grace, the Jewish people. And then chapters 12 to 16, he's going to show what does living by grace, what does it look like on a day to day basis in a very concrete way. That'll be chapters 12 to 16. So what does this all mean for us? You know, the things that we've looked at? Well, first of all, you are not condemned if you are in Christ Jesus. You're not condemned. Your only question is, am I in Christ? That's the only question we need to answer. We are, of course, if we've been baptized into Christ, right? Galatians 3.26, all those who've been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Acts 2.38, Romans 6, 3, 4, we covered that. Those who have been buried with Christ in baptism will raise up again, right? So all those in Christ are justified. And if you are justified, you are as saved as you're ever going to be. So we can take the Oldest saint, I don't know who the oldest saint in the church is, I, I don't want to name. Uh, we know that Ron looks like the oldest person in the church. You know? So he is the, he is the you know, let's say he is saved. I, I don't know who was, who was, we had a teenager I think baptized recently. That teenager and Ron who's been a Christian for 50, 60, 70, 80 years or whatever. You know, that teenager who's been a Christian for a week and that mature saint has been a Christian an entire lifetime, they're equally saved. One is not more saved than the other. We need to understand that fact. You can't, you can't do anything to get more saved. That's what I, remember I said, this is the most misunderstood principle in Christianity. You have Christians doing stuff in order to guarantee their salvation or to be more saved or to be more sure. No. If you've obeyed the gospel, I confessed Christ, I was buried in the waters of baptism in His name, that's it, fellas, you are saved, you're never going to get any more saved. Now, the second summary, you grow in Christ, ah, yeah, I make that effort to serve, I study my Bible more, I try to deal with my sin, sinful flesh, you know, all those things. That's the process of sanctification. So you are growing in Christ, not to save yourself. You're growing in Christ to do three things. One, to maintain your salvation, you must grow to stay alive. It's the law of the natural world, but it's also the law of the spiritual world. You're also growing in order to glorify God. That's the way to honor Him and praise Him. That's how you grow and develop. 
It's also a way to provide a witness to the world. You know, when I became a Christian, uh, you, know, I, you know my story, I became a Christian as an adult and my father, you know, he was in the mob. And uh, you know, uh, when I was a young man, I still, my father had died, but there were still a lot of people who knew him from those days. And I used to go to a tailor and have suits made at one of my dad's old cronies who knew him when he was a boxer, and when he was in the mob, when he was a bookie, all that kind of stuff. You know? And I remember going in there you know, one day, hey, Mikey, how's it going? Long time, no see. Come on, hey, Johnny, look who's here. It's Tony's kid. Come on in, Mike, you having a suit? Sure, we're going to do it. You know? So he's measuring me for a suit. So he said, so Mike, what are you doing these days? I said, I'm a minister. <laughs> he said several expletive words <laughs> that I shall not repeat. Johnny, come here, you won't believe this. Yeah, people don't believe who you were, where you came from, and now you're this other person. This other thing, this honors God, this glorifies Christ. Maybe not always that dramatically, but you know. People at work notice things that change in your life, habits that are becoming you know, part of your character. So why am I doing that? Well, I'm, you know, I'm doing that to give God glory, not just in church on Sunday when I sing and praise, but in the way I conduct myself at work, at school, whatever, I honor God with my life. And the process of sanctification, the growth in Christ, I do this to receive blessings. You can't appreciate all the spiritual blessings that come with being alive in Christ unless you mature and develop in the knowledge of God and His word. When Paul was a little kid, he never really understood the joy of driving a car when he was like you know, six months old. But by the time he was 10 years old, oh, he couldn't wait to get his license. You know, a lot of Christians are unhappy because they are still too immature to experience the blessings that await a more fully developed faith. There's motivation in growing because there's good stuff waiting for you that can't be explained to you until you enter into it. You know, it's trying to uh, try to explain the joys of marriage, let's say, to a five year old. They don't get it. Girls. Ugh. Right. You need to mature. And then as you mature, you realize the joys that come with married life and the challenges. So make sure that you're in Christ. And if you are, realize that you're as saved as you're ever going to get. So take comfort in that. And also make sure that you're following the lead of the Holy Spirit so that you will fully experience the full presence of God and the joy of all the blessings that He provides in Christ. He makes Christian life worth it if you follow Him in the way that He has asked you to do so. OK, so that's lesson 11 in this series. We're going to move on. As I say, we're going to cover chapters 9 and 11, those who refused grace. We're going to do that next time. Thank you for your attention.